welcome to the stage, Andrew Brown. Um, I expect some of you here tonight had, had a childhood, did you? No, <laughs> no, no. I believe I did once. Um, Rose here, who we're going to hear in the second half, she has a poem where uh, she says, suggests that we only actually ever remember ten minutes of it. That's bad, isn't it? Um, anyway, I had a tutor of mine that asked me to uh, write about childhood, and I remember meeting, you know, bumping into that sort of blank wall and thinking, well, what the hell do I remember about it? Not a lot. No, the memories had to be bullied, and this piece is about uh, the process of trying to remember, and it's called Lost Flags of Eden. And you, I'm sorry about this first line. Uh, some people in a writing group I was in I thought it was rather rude, but you're all adults, aren't you? No. <laughs> the coloured bunting, strung from branch to branch, is nothing compared to the white flag of your knickers as you climb the tree. I can't remember the colour of your skirt, blue perhaps, but I mustn't get caught gazing at you there. But what does it matter? I don't really know what I'm looking at anyway. No, come down. Let me look you full in the face. Here, grab my hand, leap down. Plunge into the new cut grass. Leave all those little apples behind. I see you clearly now. Holding on to my right hand with yours. Your left hand pulling at your skirt. Your yellow top. Your eyes lifting to mine with that glorious smile. A flash of whiteness that doesn't tease me for the gaps in my knowledge. Your hair is blonde, it's just long enough to brush your shoulders, your skin so pale and your eyes barely blue. In this moment we are bonded, you in your black shoes with their single strap, white socks beneath bare knees. It's the day of the church fate. This is my garden, the vicarage garden, now full of people who do not generally belong here. The flags have been drawn from their long, dark hibernation. Some are stiff and mildewed and refuse to flutter, others have life. They've been hauled from the garage and over Mrs. Gray's white elephant stall, <laughs> strung from the tar-covered telegraph poles and away to the trees of heaven. There they are, tattered and floppy, yet who can resist them? Mrs. Jones with her shopping basket can't. She looks in, dragged along by these bright, intoxicating colours. Now I see it. The stores that make the money, run by the trusted mainstays of the parish, the big names whose identities are now perfectly erased from this landscape. Trestles have been set up on the lawn, tombola, cakes, bottles. Teas come from our kitchen, which is suddenly so full of big ladies, it becomes a no-go area for us children. Oddly, there are card tables set out beneath the plum trees, and the children, if we like, can have horse rides up and down the drive. I'm not so sure. Looking up at the black beast, I'm really not sure. But someone hands over sixpence, and here I am, perched high above the hedge. Then onward to coconut shies and skittles, this is more fun, the clunk of wood on wood, the bristly coconut prizes with their eyes and jagged hair. They can't help it, you know, each winner must give it a shake. There, can you hear the milk? Oh, come on, I'll show you something else. Uh, squeeze in under this privet, there are narrow passageways that bend beneath the hedge. Look at this dry, dusty ground, it hasn't rained here for years. And see, a stash of ancient broken bottles and a rusty fire guard. Wow, she says in wonderment. But hang on a minute, you spoke, you definitely spoke. I gaze back intoxicated once more by your blonde perfection. You spoke, I say out loud. Well, but you were just a vision, a memory, was I? Oh, I'm bored with this. Come, show me something else, she says. So we're off. A wild escapade, I follow on your sinuous trail, roaring through the forest of legs and ducking under trestles, risking the petulant wrath of ancient stallholders. Then down the shingle beaches of the drive, into the valley of thorns where cricket balls go and are never found. Away beneath the tallest trees, the ditch where the stag beetles live, the small elders wagging sprays of not yet purple fruit, a bottle green fruit of ivy clinging like a dread blanket. We don't like this much. But we love the petrified forest of stems that once grew out of it, a lush green crop of cow parsley here once, back in the spring. Now it clatters as we rattle through, snapping sticks that scratch red lines on our bare legs, long tendrils of goose grass dragging from our shoes. We make it back to the apple tree, breathless. Back up the tree, you say. And once again, the white unknown, a page of something not yet written. Here we are then. Up above the world, up among the flags, covered in the black seeds of life yet to come. I see you clearly now, 
an embryonic eve, a yellow flag and a white flag surrounded by the nodding green apples of July. Don't even bother to pick them. They're sour and smaller than a child's fist. When I was growing up, I, I sort of had two sets of parents. There was mother, an energetic vicar's wife, father, whom everyone in the whole village called father, which was a bit confusing. And um, <laughs> beyond that, in the language of the day, there was God the Father and his bride, the church. <laughs> Against that lot, it, was, it wasn't always easy to establish quite who you were. This is called smoke. Only the sudden flare would give it away, and then only the sound of it, for it was well hidden like some holy mystery. I puckered my lips as if for a kiss, and blew a soft, steady stream of air. Veins of iron filing sparked, fire licked the black object I held carefully in my right hand. I needed to draw out a constant glow. Only then would the dark, bitter, woody smell arise, but there was no smoke. It was necessary to hold it in, in such a way that the lit end would be carefully hidden by your hand. If you didn't, it could be seen a mile off and the unwary would get caught. Some of them hid behind the bike sheds, but only the less intelligent. Old slimy green would be certain to look there, but he would never suspect the middle of the yard. It was really a case of lending distance and giving out the right body language. Then you simply turned away from the windows as you nonchalantly put the thing to your lips. Behind the pillar, it was different. Mrs. Samways would already be coughing at the thought of it. The art was in the timing. The matches, charcoal and tongs had to be ready. Once you'd lit the match, there was no going back. The offertory began, and the orange glow was now scabbed over by a thin grey ash. The organ blew its sound up beyond the early English arches. Hark the songs of peaceful Zion, thunder like a mighty flood. My father was there, rigged out in his priestly array. So strange, and yet for me so entirely normal. Then there was this, the issue of this smoke. This too had its role. It placed us proudly in the Anglo-Catholic heights of the C of E. The charcoal with its blackened dish now placed in the burnished brass of the thurible. The chains clattering as I swung it to and fro to keep it burning. The incense spooned from a tin marked pure Evesham sandalwood into a little dish with a lid on it called a boat. Sometimes I would have a small child with me. I would be the thurifer, he the boat boy. It didn't matter if it happened to be a girl, she was always the boat boy. We would meet a little, in a little conclave in the middle of the sanctuary, and the priest would scatter the precious grains of incense over the glowing ash. My father liked incense and he would pile it on thick, and this huge plume of smoke would rise, and Mrs. Samways would cough and cough. <laughs> the priest looked down on her with a pitying contempt. This is how I remember my father. Though the cloud from sight received him, when the forty days were o'er, shall our hearts forget his promise, I am with you evermore. Yes, so he is, though he wouldn't approve of me applying those words to him. The art of the playground smoke was different. By holding the cigarette down by your side in a cupped hand, the fumes seemed to creep up the back of your arm and were already thinned and partly dispersed by the time they got away from you. Drawing the smoke in was an accomplishment in itself, and it was released only very slowly, through the nose, if you had the skill. Ralph Jones, Johnny Myers and I were a conclave of this rather different sort, and we performed our ceremonies according to our own rites. We didn't like showiness. There was nothing Anglo-Catholic about us. One day, it all went wrong. Slimy Green appeared from nowhere and whisked us into his office. There he raged and fumed, and the smoke reached my father in the form of a letter addressed to Mr Chatterton Pusey. I was there when he opened it. He wasn't pleased. In fact, he seemed rather irritated even before he opened it. I've always wondered if he actually took in what it said. I don't know. If he did, he never mentioned it. With a degree of outrage in his voice, he threw the letter aside. Obviously not written by a church person, he said, in that posh, pious, priestly voice of his. He should know. I'm the Reverend Chatterton Pusey, not Mr. With that dismissal, he seemed to stub the letter out. Instead, he picked up another. We regret to inform you that the commodity price of raw incense gum has been steadily rising in world markets, he read. And we direct your attention to our new price list given below. Look at that, he said, pointing to the list in disgust. Pure Eastern sandalwood, now more than a pound a pound. 
He puffed out his cheeks, pulled a face, and put the paper down. Then, lost in his own thoughts, he proceeded to write. I waited on in silence. Suddenly he looked up again and seemed surprised to see me. Did you want something, dear? he asked. No, no, not at all, I replied. And having first secured Slimy Green's letter and put it in my pocket, I drew a deep, relieved breath. I held it for a moment, then silently let it go and drifted away quietly from the unexpected sanctuary. <laughs> fabulous spoken words, some amazing poets, some fantastic music. We're going to take a short break now and see you again in about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.